Now let's continue our conversation. Well, Larry, that was a very inspiring uh, message for us, and I wonder if we might start with this idea of a world of separation versus world of unity. It feels like we're in the world of separation more often than not. I think we're all, all the time, in the world of separation, except for those glistening moments of heightened awareness when we slip into something where we realize we are all part of the same great unity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, I, I, I'm almost afraid to think that we actually might have been created with the intention of us abiding in the world of unity. Yes. Uh, now, so we're missing it by a mile, don't you think? Larry? Well, the, the great problem of mysticism is if God is one mm -hmm. and we're all present within the world of unity in the ocean of God, then why did God bother making the world? Mm -hmm. And no mystical tradition has come up with a conclusive or definitive answer. Well, I got an idea. <laughs> I, I, you know, if, I, if I'm God, I'd kind of like to share it with somebody. And isn't it possible that it really is a one big share you know, of the universe, the, our lifetime? The, the Nobel that... laureate, Elie Wiesel, says the reason God made the world was that he was lonely and wanted some more stories. Oh. And stories are the ways in which we define being human, the ways in which we try to have intercourse with the rest of the world and each other. So I, that works for me. Abraham Heschel says that a story is where the heart surprises the head. Oh, <laughs> oh nice. I love what you said, too, about this greater connectingness of, of all of us kind of being in that, that place of nothingness. Um, it's challenging, in a way, for, for many of us to make time and space for that and set things away so we can do that. Experiencing isn't it? the nothingness. Yeah. And it sounds funny because mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive. Exactly. It doesn't mean nothing. It really means the everything. Right. Experiencing the all and the great unity is something that is available to any one of us and all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you might have discovered in your own lives or in our viewers' lives, that it's something that actually can happen without warning. And not necessarily in synagogue or church, not necessarily on a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. sometimes in rush hour traffic, sometimes when you're up late at night with the baby. Mm -hmm. Every, you'll get a glimmer, you'll get a sense, oh my God, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And you touched upon something early on when you first gave us a definition of mysticism. This connectedness includes sorrow, travail, challenges, as well as the beatific visions of birds taking flight. In other words, I, I gathered from what you said sure. that it's a seamless wave. Yes. The, the man who taught me how to sail a boat in New England, uh, in his accent, said, uh, any damn fool can sail a boat in a hurricane, but it takes a real sailor to make one go in no wind. <laughs> so uh -huh. I, it, I think what that means is, uh -huh. is that uh, we start with times of experiencing the, the wonder of creation mm -hmm. uh, at easy times, but people who are serious about it and devoted seekers after a while try to expand it to increasingly less likely places mm -hmm. and occasions. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, do you think we can try to create more opportunity for that world of unity by being, just being more open in general? You mentioned your wife pulled you along on that trip that you probably had no intention on going on and joked that you know, she owed you for that. But it, it can happen anywhere, and it can happen all the time. Okay. And my advice to my students always is to start with what works and then try to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. it, don't start with visiting a friend who's dying in a hospital. Uh -huh. But when you get good at it, you can begin to find the sacred nothingness and your connection to it in increasingly less likely places. The other thing I like about your perspective is that um, you're seeing the mystical experience as something that's available to everyone, not just people who are practiced uh, theologians or clergy or, or holy people or saints, but you know, something I'm convinced, that's there for each of us. Yes, I'm convinced that everyone has mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not where the roof flies off the building and you all of a sudden hear the Mormon tabernacle singing Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. Mm -hmm. They're more like quickie moments mm -hmm. for just a, a split second where you get a glistening sense of your presence in the great unity. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, uh, then you go on about your daily life again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Is this something you've come to in, in your um, time as a rabbi? I mean, this is non-traditional to a certain extent. Um, is it something that's... It's my attempt to make sense out of religious experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and what I discover as I talk to people and try to monitor my own life 
is that I begin to realize that uh, n nothing is beneath being a footstool for the sacred. <laughs> Oh, that's right. That, that is a beautiful way of putting it. I wonder if there is some, well, I like what you say to your students about begin with what works. For someone who's not working at all at this, for someone who, for whom the word mysticism itself is kind of spooky and like, what can that possibly have to do with my everyday life? Yeah. What kind of a, a handrail can you give them to step into Such this a person, I would, I would respectfully submit that even for such a person, there are moments when he or she has a sense that there's something bigger and something more. Mm -hmm. And it is always beyond language, and it is always nameless, but it is always sacred, mm -hmm. and I think it's the most important moments in life. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if people who, who don't believe in God at all, or at least don't think they believe in God at all, would agree with that statement that you just made. Um, I would say, as a mystic, it doesn't matter what you call it. Okay. Oh, okay. Again, like what you said, it's like it, words, in a way, can separate us from a real insight into our connectedness. And maybe even the word God, for some people, is, is a hot button. Well, I could, close be, them off. I could be mischievous and say sometimes people who are convinced they believe in God don't, and sometimes people who are convinced they don't do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's mischievous, but... Probably accurate. <laughs> right. It's a wonderful paradox at, at the heart of this, as you said, really, um, that we need to, to be open to this, and yet it's, it's about not doing anything necessarily and, and I, listening. I would, yes, I think I would even add, I would say often people are afflicted by what is almost a compelling need to have to believe in God, and mm. I would say don't worry about belief. Just ask yourself, were there times when you were close to God? Mm -hmm. And what were you doing when you felt close? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I believed, but sure, I was close to God. Well, what were you doing, and what could you do to increase the likelihood of those times of divine proximity mm -hmm. in your life? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I, I, I'm totally stoked. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, no. about you, but I'm really encouraged by uh, your presentation and our conversation with you to, uh, to really pursue the mystical union myself and, and to encourage people I know to do the same. Thank you. Thank so you. very, very much.